start the recording. Virginia, you, you see the full uh, PowerPoint now in, in the large uh, landscape, yeah? Yes, it's fine. It's yeah. fine for Nico. So I suggest that we start. Good afternoon to everybody. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome our guest speaker today, Professor Panikos Podzuris, who is currently director of the University of Central Lancashire in Cyprus. He is the professor of entrepreneurship and family business, and also chair of Center for Entrepreneurial Development Alliance and Research. He is as well a fellow at Judge Business School, University of Cambridge working with the Economics and Policy Group on Circular Economics and Entrepreneurial Development Models. For two decades, he was a senior lecturer and later a visiting associate professor of entrepreneurship and family business at the Alliance Manchester Business School UK, where his initiatives enjoyed support from NatWest Bank, Grant Thornton, BDO Stoy Hayward, Hayward KPMG, Ernst & Young, PwC, etc. He cooperated with FBN International and other as well uh, organizations such as JP Morgan, etc. And he has been leading a number of teaching, training, research and consultancy initiatives around the world with a focus on entrepreneurial development of family business across generations. And currently, Professor Pozuris is going to talk to us on the very important, on one very important topic for every family business: uh, how to hand over uh, these family businesses from generation to generation. And he's going to concentrate specifically on the so-called family offices. So. Uh, Professor Pozuris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you for the invitation to join this uh, series of forums. It's always a pleasure and honor to work with the WUS University. The, we have done a few seminars in the past, and I hope we shall continue also to enjoy your expertise, you know, addressing uh, our uh, people at the Euclid Cyprus. So, the topic of family business is uh, close to my heart. I do appear to be an enthusiast, but uh, today I shall uh, also try to be a Democrat and, uh, and uh, address also, you know, the so-called the good, the bad and the ugly dimension of family business entrepreneurship. Um, you know, I would like to highlight that um, um, I speak uh, some Bulgarian, you know, Moido Jena e Bulgarga, but because the, the forum has been advertised in English, I shall stick to the English uh, lexicon. I've done some background um, homework, you know, only uh, recently, and it's true that not many family businesses advertise in Bulgaria the fact that they are a family business. So that's something that we could direct more research. Obviously, we come across some brands like uh, the winery Mingov Bradia. Uh, they have been in business since 1875. But, uh, you know, when you live in Bulgaria, you know, and you work in Bulgaria, you come across a lot of family firms. I have been visiting Bulgaria for the last 20 years, every summer and sometimes uh, the so-called Orthodox um, Easter. Yes, and it's lots and lots of family firms around. It's just that perhaps they are still in the first generation and they think, um, you know, the so-called heritage and the legacy will start once they go to the next generation. So let's see how you know a smaller family business <clears throat> can develop into a more established sizable operation then they can become a business family where the so-called family control is, is diluted or there is a diversification 
into other activities, including joint ventures. And then at the lateral stage, you know, the so-called family, family run business could become an investment family, uh, directing investments and wealth management under the family office. I have been delivering a module at uh, the executive MBA of Cambridge University called Enterprising Families and the Family Office. So this is a kind of a taster for that module. And briefly, I will start with the role of family firms in economic activity, demonstrate through some traditional diagnostics how they develop and where they could derail. And here, I would like to emphasize the so-called owner-managed family business, because there is no separation of ownership and management. You know, the founders are the family, they run, they manage, they own, with a view to pass it on to the next generation, it could be the next generation of family owner managers or loyal managers or a combination of all um, stakeholders. I will share a few diagnostics, you know, that we use to better understand the dynamics uh, pertinent to the owner managed family business model. You know, there is the so-called traditional ownership, management, and family. So we will demonstrate the operation of the subsystems, introduce the governance that can help us to better manage family business across generations. And I shall conclude with some uh, commandments, essential steps for uh, family business continuity planning. So what is a family business? Do we have any family firms in the forum today, in the audience? I cannot measure hands. Uh, feel free to speak if uh, somebody, you know, can also tell us what is your family business about? Any volunteers? Okay, here, I illustrate pictorially what is a family business. But in summary, I will highlight that we are talking about three dimensions. The family running the business, managing the business, the family controlling the ownership, and the third, its aspirations to keep it into family hands i.e. not to plan an exit strategy, not to take it to the stock market. And uh, here we have a lot of um, dynasties, uh, including political dynasties. Uh, a few years ago, Poland was run by two brothers. So the so-called family control, it's not exclusive only to family firms. So, in brief, the family business economy is very important. I think it should be featured also on, on the MBA program structure. We come under the so-called entrepreneurship umbrella. Why is it important? Because 85% of all enterprises across Europe are classified, defined as family firms. They represent in the US, in the US, one in three of coded firms that they are registered in the stock markets are classified as family controlled. This goes up in France, in Spain, in Asia. Family business economy represents 70% of private employment and economic activity. And when you ask, the family firms to indicate which generation is control, you tend to get 60% in the first generation, 30% in the second, and about 10% in the third generation. 
In fact, 3.4 make it to the fourth generation. Continuously, one third, about 40% of these family firms, they are in generational transition, meaning they could be in the process of handing power from the first to the second, to the second, to the third, and etc. So it's important for the governments and the European Union to better support what we call transfer to the next generation. In our case, it's all about succession planning today because failure for uh, effective succession will destroy not only value, but it will jeopardize the socio-economic development of a nation. And uh, we have fantastic family firms that they are proud and they do a wonderful job and they do what we call good business for good purposes. But we also have some bad and some ugly ones that the family lost control because of feuding. And uh, one of the most celebrated family feud has been the, the Gucci empire. You know, today, the Gucci brand does not belong to the Gucci family. They lost through an exit a few decades ago because of failure to plan for succession. So, the family business has a dual legacy. We have advantages, especially at the early stages of business development. To be a family business, you enjoy a lot of strong relations, trust-based relationships. They are proud about the product, the, the artisan culture. They have a long-term horizon. They are very flexible. They tap into family talent. They are very focused. They don't like a lot of diversification. They tend to have one brand. They serve a niche and they enjoy loyalty from their clients, loyalty from their people, and they invest in continuity, commitment. They are very prudent financially, okay? And they don't have these problems we define in financial economics, agency cost, owners versus managers, because they are owner managers with the family in control. Over time, some of these advantages, especially with growth, will translate into disadvantages. You know, the rigidity, the fact that they don't enjoy effective professional communication, there is nepotism, lack of professionalism, they are hooked on emotional matters, and it's family first instead of business first. They have a narrow human and financial capital, there is conflict, succession crisis, and sometimes we are proud that family business leaders could have a very, very long tenure, but simultaneously sometimes they are hooked on the so-called throne. They don't want to relinquish control and they could manipulate the business for family ends. And we have agency cost type two, meaning, Owners versus owners, majority shareholders, branch A of the family versus branch B, minority. So on that basis, we need to be aware that we have to do further research to better understand this family business model. And over the years, if you Google my name, if you visit my LinkedIn uh, you will be able to download some of these uh, uh, reports that uh, I enjoyed support from prestigious organizations. And uh, the message is that the family business model works under conditions like governance, like effective communication, 
I will soon define the so-called 12 C's, okay? And currently we are involved also in a number of um, European Union funded projects. Spring is the latest one. And also Bulgaria has a family business chapter. They are members of the European Family Business Network, EFP, and also Family Business Network International. If you Google that, you will be able to tap into the Bulgarian chapter. So, how do family firms develop? There are three axes. The business axis, like every business, you start micro, you become small, you survive, you consolidate, you expand, you embark on fast growth, and then you hit maturity, and here you need to re-engineer innovation-based growth, diversification, internationalization, and you expand the small business unit into a small empire, a number of business units, okay? And here we need to do the business structure, and we need to understand the organizational structure of every business, especially the core business. And often, because of a number of good reasons, tax planning and uh, financial planning, you know, sometimes the so-called group of uh, family firms, they could uh, restructure into a holding. And the holding could be in family hands, 100%, and then they could reduce their control in the so-called uh, operating companies. Okay, so that's the business access, and I don't worry about that because there are a lot of great consultancy firms to support family business entrepreneurs. The soft area, it's the so-called family ownership. The second axis is the family, the young family in parallel to setting up and running the business, they are growing their family. They have uh, kids, they grow, they work maybe on a part-time basis, seasonally into the family business, then they enter, there is the partnership of generations, the founding generation is generation one, Tony Maria is generation one, and then we have generation two, their kids. So there is a stage where there is a partnership of generations. And then when we relinquish control, first managerial authority is given to the next generation, and then we offer the shares. And with the completion of the transfer, there is a transformation on the ownership axis. And here we have three arch stages. The first stage is the controlling owner, where the founder, has control of the business. It could be 51%, it could be 60, and uh, a brother could have 40%. The most prolific one is the founder to have 100% of the shares. And then with generational um, succession, we pass the shares to the next generation, and we have the sibling partnership. And here the question is, what values do we have? How do we split this equally or equitably? We will revisit the values down the road. And then the second generation, they will pass the shares to the so-called third generation, and we will go from sibling partnership to cousin consortium. So you realize, we have a fragmentation of ownership here. So we may need to address this. Otherwise, nobody will have enthusiastic ownership. There will be a dilution of commitment. So this is how family firms develop on three axes, and we have to balance this. We need to exercise parallel succession and growth planning. 
Otherwise, if the business outgrows the family, we need to recruit outsiders to help us run the business. So we need to re relinquish control here, put uh, water into the so-called wine. We cannot exercise full control because we need to recruit outsiders, professionals, and probably bring outside capital. Now, if the family outgrows the business, we need to prune the family tree, have criteria in terms of leadership succession, management succession, to bring the best to run and uh, succeed the family business. So it's not an accident that we said one in 10 reached the third generation because a lot of people exercise poor planning. You know, they concentrate too much on the business and they overlook the family and the ownership complication. And there is conflicting, you know, uh, dynamics or they decide to exit or the family loses control simply because they sold out, okay? But we know 50% of family firms, they don't do any planning in terms of succession planning. So this is the danger zone. So we have a lot of um, family firms out there. The great majority, they tend to be lifestyle firms like the Scottish. However, on the corporate landscape, you'll see some super brands in family hands. You know, in the car industry, Ford, Fiat, in the fashion industry, in the shoe industry, in the whiskey business, in guns, Beretta is one of the eldest. They belong to the Henogiens, you know, a, a family business association in Europe. Members are more than 200 years old, okay? The eldest on planet Earth is Hoshi Hotel, one unit, and they celebrate 46 generations. So the question is, how do these, you know, giants, family dynasties make it from generation to generation. We need to understand how they manage growth. And growth, in terms of the business access, I classify two groups of challenges. One is the classic business growth challenge, you know, to define the business model, to define the markets, to have strong management, to manage money and manage the so-called ego, ensure that the me is transformed as soon as possible into we. Okay, so that's the classic business side. When we have the family owner managed directors, they need to also manage the dozen of seeds define their culture and ensure the values are compatible with the business strategy, manage control, manage conflict, build continuity, ensure there is commitment from first, second, third generation, ensure there is alliance and uh, alignment of goals, effective communication, enough capital, human capital, financial capital to fuel growth, especially if we don't want outsiders. Use cash wisely to keep all the stakeholders happy, especially the passive shareholders, okay? Look after the lawyers and build the constitution, the rule book, the protocol that will provide guidance as to how we live, how we work, how we own and build succession planning, okay? So if I illustrate this now with a, a case study, here is Island Stores, Cypriot entrepreneurs from Cyprus 
to London and the UK, and then now they are doing business also in Cyprus again. The beginning, it's uh, the generation one, the papas, the father, started groceries and then vertical integration backwards, food manufacturing and the trading company, and then vertical integration forward, the next generation developed grill houses and met resto bars. And then with the third generation coming on board, hotels, boutique hotels, and met resto bars in the hotels, and then investment in a washed area, bubble dry cleaning business to look after their ventures and others. So all these, it belongs, you know, it's gradually shifting into a halting. Okay. So this is what we call a small empire of growing companies, three groceries, two companies in food, uh, manufacturing and trading, four and scope to franchise here, three resto bars, three hotels, two washed areas. Now, how do we understand the stakeholders now? Here we have the family. This is the founding generation still alive, involved in the business, husband and wife. This is the th second generation, George, capital, underline, bloodline, Paris, Tim, and Nina, the sister. Okay? And this is their third generation. Okay? All active in the business, except Drea, Rena, and Dan. So you can see that things are getting complicated. So what they have done to manage the so-called growth of the family from two to four times two, and now they've got 10 third generation and they started to get him married, but I'm not including them on the family tree because I'm running out of space, of course. So we need to understand now how they are planning growth. They have adopted the so-called alchemy of growth, the three growth horizons, as advised by the McKinsey consultants. The core business has been the chain of groceries. They scale up so that they can enjoy economies of scale. They have built a central production unit to serve the groceries but also their kebab houses and others with the Mediterranean dips and also importing and trading food. They have built logistics to make operational efficiency in the core business. And then to prepare business units for the family units, they have built the delicatessens and the bakery units within the stores because this line brings clients to the core business. They have started the first grill house in the grocery and now they have externalized and they are planning of franchising out. They have built hotels, they have built resto bars into the hotels. So this is the core business this is the next generation of new business ventures to support the core business and to create business activities for the family units. And then continuously, they evaluate ideas, ideas to grow their empire, to become stronger, to offer opportunities for growth for their family members, but also the loyals and continuously they're working out with innovations. During the COVID-19 crisis, they have obviously activated the home delivery, but they were proud to start a drive-through grocery so that nobody 
exits the cars and the so-called parents, they don't leave their car with the kids in there and uh, continuously, you know, they value the new ways of doing business, innovation process as we call it, but also ownership, ownership, innovation. So they are building two classes of shares so that they can franchise out and partners that will buy the franchise will only have ordinary shares with no voting power. The voting shares will remain in the holding. So this is what we call um, innovation in terms of funding, ownership, and controlling growth. So that's the easy part, you know, managing growth. To understand the complexity now in terms of the family ownership, we have the three circle models. So we have introduced the three axis model. Now we have the three axis model. Sorry, the three circle model. We have the ownership, we have the business management, and we have the family. So in the early stages, husband and wife, the founders, they are group one. They are kids, second generation, family managers. They are in the management. They are members of the family. They don't have any shares, group two. When they get shares, they become group one. The family, it's here. The young ones, it's generation three, group three, okay? The group four, it's the loyal managers. They don't have any ownership and they are not members of the family. Group five, it's those partners, you know, loyal managers that they will get ownership. They will continue to manage, but they are not members of the family. Okay, and group six, it's what we call outside investors. Now, group seven is passive shareholders. Those that they don't work in the business, they are not managers, they are members of the family, okay? And they have a minority shareholding. So in this case, we don't have the board of directors. We call it top management team. If we introduce also the board of directors, the so-called seven groups becomes 15 groups, okay? So I don't need to emphasize how important it is for a growing company, for an empire of small firms or a family business dynasty to build good governance to manage all these stakeholders. And what we propose, it's the parallel business and family planning. We need to have a board of directors. We need to have a family council to embrace the next generation, to embrace what we call active and passive shareholders. And the beginning of all this is to discuss our values, our purpose, our goals. So I have mentioned earlier on, what values do we have in terms of choosing our leader, splitting the shares, getting financing, the level of growth, the type and the level of innovation, how much risk, how much diversification, which markets to expand to. All these are driven by values, okay? And the succession planning, is it only bloodline? Is it the best? Are we open to recruit an outsider? All these are part of the so-called parallel planning process. Three P's made at IMD and a very topical um, issue nowadays has been the family tree of the British royal family. What values do they have in terms of leadership succession? 
always give priority to the first son that's charles so everybody's looking at charles and his son and his grandson so that's the bloodline once we have boys okay clearly it's a value driven succession planning they give priority to the boys sorry ladies so if i go back to the early stages of our papas because i've been close to this family for decades now you know in the early days they had a couple of stores and there was the scope to expand with three more stores and the vertical integration with the production unit so that they can cater the groceries and the butcheries with foods and delis so in those days papas the founder had uh, and continues to have strong control tendencies he was against bringing outside management and outside capital so the decision was based on these values of the founder to build two more stores because they had sons free single not married that they could travel to the other cities to look after these new ventures and they kept phase b at the lateral stage so that they can have a member of the family with the food technology to run that unit okay so basically you know at the early stages the value system indicated stable growth match a family unit to a business unit and uh, set up a, a, another company for the sister because it's another trick to keep the in-laws away from the from the holding the so-called family operations strong respect for low debt okay no trust in outsiders okay and in terms of financial pecking order preference to retain profits so that we don't depend on the banks okay and one more the first son did not want to become the chief executive officer the the second the son is the chief executive officer the father now it's the the grandfather is the emeritus chair and the so-called first son you know chairs the so-called family council so and they have delegated the the so-called organization of the family forums to the third son so here we have a chief executive officer the second son the chief emotional officer it's the first son and the third son manages what we call the family forums opening to the next generation so this is a little example of balancing the so-called business and the family planning respecting you know what we call the family values which works when you are a small family business at the lateral stage you know we will revisit and establish what else do they do especially on the governance uh, level so how do large groups in family hands manage their governance this is the weights group if you google weights they are an active member of the institute for family business uk you will also be able to register some good case studies featuring their success story and this is their governance on the enterprise side the business side they have the organizational structure they have their business structure and they have what we call strong board with executive directors non-executive directors 
And then on the family side, they have the family governance. They have the family council. And the family council delegates the so-called activities of the family, like a forum for the next generation. They have set up a family office to manage the so-called corporate assets by sending family nominees to the board of directors. And they also manage other investments. They also manage the philanthropy, the next generation education, and they build policies like employment of family members in the business, the remuneration policies, the risk management policies, and so many other activities, including succession planning. And recently, they have taken the decision to employ an outsider as the chief executive officer, because the family has so strong family governance that they are comfortable, you know, to delegate this to outside professionals, okay? So this is what we call two-tier governance. You get this in a lot of groups. So what we propose, in addition to our five M's and the so-called 12 C's, is to do a diagnostic before we decide to do parallel business and succession planning. So here we will do an interview of all these stakeholders to define the R's. R's here is roles, rights, responsibilities, rewards, and then we will be in a position after the diagnostics of the family structure and after an evaluation of the wealth and the estate planning. And here we will do some trusts and some tax planning. And we will fit all this together on the business access through our board of directors the executive management team through the business planning and on the family and ownership access through the works of the family council and the so-called family office and the synthesis of a family constitution. I will show you towards the end the structure of a family constitution. An example, it's next generation upon completion of their studies they have to work outside the family business three years and then they apply for a job in the family business group in terms of profits 85 percent of profits are to be retained only 15 percent will be distributed through a dividend policy these are rules Succession planning, a candidate for the chief executive office position has to have at least one university degree, five years experience in the family business, three years outside the family business to be a candidate. So all these are communicated and there is no room for failing because there are rules and there is effective communication. But I repeat, in the epicenter of all this, it's the cultural configuration of the business. We define the values. And here we're talking about professionalism. Here we're talking about effective communication. Here we're talking about the respect. And all these are embedded both on the business side but also the family side. So to recap, what we have, it's the introduction of governance for the business of the business and for the family ownership, the family governance. And uh, 
in terms of the case study, so that I can conclude, we are going to apply the following structure. You know, as we have indicated, we have operating companies, and I have simplified these in sectors. There is a holding, and 60% will be transferred in a trust, and this remaining 40%, it will be 10% in each of the four branches, so that they can have liquidity. If anybody wanted to sell, they can sell to their family branch. So that gives the stability, you know, the holding of 60% of shares in a trust. It's tax efficient. And if there is a death, a divorce on the family side, it does not destabilize the family business continuity. So I think I can skip a couple of them. So what we have to conclude is that we start as a small family business. We expand. We can set up trusts. We can set up a family office to do additional investments. And that family office can invest in other family business units, as we have indicated. So what is this family office? A family office, it could be a new company, a new limited company, it could be an investment company, or it could be simply a virtual office. But in my example here, it's a limited liability company that manages, handles the investment management, the wealth management of a successful, wealthy family, family dynasty, having assets of about 100 million. So in here, it could be the family business plus other investments, okay? So the family office handles a range of tasks from managing household staff, insurance for the family houses, insurance for the holiday homes, insurance and travel, you know, for the members of the family, property management, when we have floods spread over the planet Earth, doing the accounting, the payroll, tax and legal affairs, plus strengthening the family governance, Okay, doing all the so-called financial and investors education for the next generation, managing the philanthropy, and also supporting the succession planning. And crudely, you know, once you have about 100 million in investable assets, it's, it's the threshold to set up a, a family office because the costs to run a family office is about 1 million, okay? And the majority of what we call families in business, they start with what we call an embedded office or a virtual office, and then they go for the single family office. And some of them, like the Rockefellers, they have a multi-family office now. So the family office aims to manage the financial capital of the family, the social capital, the philanthropy, and all this, plus the human capital, prepare the next generation, okay? So wealth here is not finance. It's financial, it's entrepreneurial, it's social, it's human capital. And an example here, you know, we will have the grandparents, you know, that founded the business. This is the second generation. This is the third generation. They will have the family business because they have other family investments. They will have the shares in a trust, as we said. There is another trust for other family assets. And then they decide somewhere in there, to have a virtual family office, 
to monitor and support the transition to the next generation and do what we call the wealth and the investment management you know for the family business entrepreneurs and the other family uh, units okay and the beneficiaries now of all this operation including what we call the trust that controls the shares will be members of the family okay because here the family trust is entrusted to trustees law units law practices specializing in trust and it's an interesting structure i don't know if bulgaria has this jurisdiction i'm sure you know you realize that this is a common law in anglo-saxon in other european countries sometimes they have the industrial foundations like Carlsberg belongs to a foundation the ikea empire belongs to a range of foundations of registered in, in in luxembourg in netherlands okay so what is the role of the so-called family office I, I have put at the apex because we are interested here for succession planning you know to support family in business continuity succession from the leadership the management and the ownership to strengthen the governance of the family because we have a board of directors to formulate the policies organize meetings ensure that communication is effective and there are specialized um, firms they look after the needs of large families in business you know trusted family and they organize everything via cloud-based uh, solutions now they support education training mentoring of the next generation they will support the business strategic planning okay strengthening the board of directors they will help the family diversify in another investment portfolio and also manage the wealth across generations you know they manage the relationship with these legal experts which we call fiduciary they do all the reporting the tax planning financial planning and they support the philanthropy the charity work and nowadays they are talking about social investing in good projects you know to save the planet and look after people and then make profits okay and there are specialized firms FOS, family office advisory is one you know that guides on the so-called rationale why to set up a single family office as we have enlisted what is the family office doing and finally my conclusion you know what is the recipe you know for sustainable business success across generations i have said respect trust unity communication or professionalization okay number one define your values you know it's it's the epitome of writing what we call the 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 history of your future it's driving goals we need a growth plan we need to ensure that the business structure the organizational structure is evolving of core business we need to have effective communication within this business and organizational structure but connected thinking between the business and the family as we said stronger board of directors establish the family governance you know we call this the family shareholders council and it's the shareholders that they will have the voting power that have the checkbook and the power and then balance how much capital for growth how much control and how much cash liquidity to keep the 
army of stakeholders happy, especially passive shareholders. Okay, and then do the family protocol, the constitution, the charter, as we say, set a family office, start with a virtual, there is a training program, how to set up your family office. 11, develop networking, family business exchange, you know, the, the, the English next generation, members of the Institute of Family Business, they go to Finland on an exchange program and they finish, they visit Germany and the Germans, they go to France and the French, they go to Spain and they visit family firms and they do this type of talking, you know, that we are doing now. And finally, set platforms for the next generation of entrepreneurs because the next generation, they have a different approach to doing business. So I will leave it here and happy to take questions. And let me close these. Are you all there? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paniko. It was insightful. Indeed, very interesting. Uh, let us open the floor for discussion now. Are there any questions from the audience? I have one question. That Please. Let me start. Uh, you, you told a lot of interesting things about succession, how important, how important it is that there should be values, that there should be uh, communication, respect, etc. A lot of things indeed are needed for success, but what is in your opinion the key obstacle for successful succession in small companies especially? Why, why so many companies do not manage to pass over, not to the third and fourth generation, but just to the second generation, their business? What happens? Why, why is it so difficult to, to do it? Yes. Thank you, Virginia. Very good question. The, in the case of smaller family firms, you know, they tend to concentrate too much effort on running the business and they overlook planning in general. And succession, it could be a process driven. I, we sit down, we discuss, we set criteria, we prepare the next generation, we set rules when, you know, the, the incumbent can give the pattern and when they go on long-term holidays and uh, et cetera. That's a process. Or it could be event. Event driven is when somebody drops dead in the shop, in the office. During the holidays, I don't want to be negative, yes? So on that basis, they are not prepared for this. And also, they think, they think, like the early days, you know, normally, you know, they start a small family business and they don't realize that they are not internal. You know, they think nothing has changed the way they do business and they overlook, you know, what are the expectations of professionals? So, uh, and, and the, the nature of the problem varies from country to country. You realize that in small countries like Cyprus, you know, a lot of small family business entrepreneurs, they don't trust outsiders because there are a lot of examples when the non-family manager will realize they will never get the opportunity to lead, they will leave and they will take their know-how and start another company. So they are waiting for the next generation to join and the next generation will surprise them. You know, when they conclude their degree, <laughs> they will say, sorry, I have a job in the bank. I have a job in the government. 
and they are not always enthusiastic to join the so-called small family business in the wrong sector. Okay, so a combination of culture, but especially failure to plan for succession timely. You know all these schemes that I did share with you? These are robust schemes that will make sure that these fantastic brands use to keep going from generation to generation. Unfortunately, generation one to generation two, it's the most dangerous transfer zone. And uh, they don't always come forward, you know, to, to ask for advice. They will say, I will do it, I will do it. And then the inevitable happens and it wasn't done okay so i hope this answers because with this governance succession becomes very easy but obviously the small family firms they don't need all this governance and they don't want it and we have issues so the message is that we need to extend support and this is what we do through the spring project the target group it's smaller family firms. How can we help them plan both for growth or survival and succession planning? And one more, sometimes founders, they think as parents. So it could be a small family firm and they insist to split it 50-50 between the two kids. That's very wrong. They should give the business to one member and then give family assets to the other next generation. But never use the family business to be fair in terms of estate planning. It's pity because we get this and it varies from culture to culture. Northern countries don't do this southern countries uh, do this obviously bulgaria is in the middle yes <laughs> thank you thank you very much yes you answered the question i i agree with you that all these problems that you mentioned are often overlooked there is some kind of lackadaisical attitude towards as though this moment will never happen why consider it from now on and it's very important to be prepared because yeah. eventually it is indeed sad uh, these people who have their own companies they have all their life dedicated to the development of the business growing it and eventually if there is nobody who can take it from their own family in many cases i think i don't know you know better but in many cases all these companies they collapse and eventually all this is lost, which is really, really very sad. So it's a very important issue, succession issues, which is overlooked, heavily overlooked, especially in Bulgaria. So Virginia, with the discussion now, succession, it's four dimensions. It's the next leader. It's the management team that will support the next leader. Then it's ownership, the shares and financials because if we are talking about the small business and the small family and we don't have any other wealth so that we can give say one son the business and the other daughter or the other son the family house there are still solutions and the solutions are two classes of shares you have voting shares and there you give the majority to the person that will be running the business. Okay, and then you split the non-voting shares so that you are fair, but you give the mandate with the classes of shares to the person that will have the responsibility because responsibility has to be rewarded with remuneration, but also rights so that they don't need to consult you know everybody to make a small decision thank you yes that's right thank you very much 
I think that uh, there is a lot of a huge gap, at least in Bulgaria, it is so for certain, a huge gap of knowledge on these topics. Um, people don't, don't understand this problem here. So also, this is a good uh, subject for uh, inclusion in our curricula, because we don't, we don't study these things, honestly. So, <laughs> If you have the flexibility to introduce an elective, yes, well, these can be delivered, say, in, in two days, two days, block delivery with case studies, a guest speaker. Yes. And uh, it's important that we also develop some local case studies so yes. that uh, we indicate to people success stories from Bulgaria and yeah. also respect the, the local culture, which sometimes varies given, uh, you know, the, their ethnic background or their religion, etc. Yeah? Yes. Thank you very much, yes. Food for thought. I see that uh, Professor Todorov has raised his hand. Professor Todorov, go ahead. Thank you, Please. Professor Zelasko. Professor Panikos, uh, it was a pleasure for me to uh, to, to listen to your lecture. If you remember when we were talking a few, uh, few weeks ago, uh, I presented myself that I'm a, a lecturer in the strategic management. And uh, uh, out of my 18 years experience, I was working in uh, 15 years, I was working in international corporations, but for three years in family business. So I'm uh, pretty clear with all the uh, with all the differences between the corporate business and family business, and for me it would be very interesting to find out out of your experience what would be what is the ratio. Of course, it, it could vary from country to country and to the level of the development of the family business. But what would be the ratio of non-family members in terms of family members of a management of a particular company because for in the in the family business for non-family member in the management is very difficult to progress or to be accepted yeah. so if there are any 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 given size or it's a, any ratio out of your experience of the uh what is the rate between the uh, family members and non-family members within the management of uh, family business. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Todorov. In the case of, you know, surveys that are often administered by KPMG, PwC, Ernst & Young, you know, the, the top four or five uh, firm of accountants, you know, normally they do uh, the barometer, we call it, across many countries. So, uh, and what you always establish is that a very, very small minority of, uh, of SMEs, smaller companies, they have an outsider, okay? So, and, but these are not always the clients of these top uh, accountancy firms because they look after uh, more sizable. So, in the case of smaller family firms, I would say, I would say less than 5% are run by outsiders. That's the smaller family firms. Now, in the case of the larger groups, what we have, normally it's a holding, and the holding is predominant, you know, in the hands of family executives and lawyers. And then they free operating companies run by professionals. So this is why we need to understand the business structure. But it's one way to ensure that these families will discuss family ownership at the holding. And they will free, you know, the managerial positions of what we call joint ventures or sometimes they have the representation, the agency of a, of a conglomerate, 
they will entrust that in professional non-family management. One reason is because the families are becoming smaller and smaller. You know, we all have 1.5 uh, kids. <laughs> so the business grows, it outgrows the family, and they don't have a lot of options. They have to bring in outside professionals. So on that basis, your question applies better, maybe not to Bulgarians and the Cypriots and Greeks that we have very, very small families. It applies better to go to Latin America that they have large families. And that's what happens there, okay? Smaller family firms remains in the hands of the family because the MBAs, I don't think they want <laughs> to join <laughs> smaller family firms. They like conglomerates. Thank you. Actually, when I was when I was learning for my MBA, actually I was working in such a family business, but this was family business with 300 employees. It was not neither a farm company. It was a. It is was a. Uh, average size company, even for for Bulgarian standards. I see. Yeah, but I think I this I think this five percent they are also applicable to Bulgarians since we don't have a tradition in terms of time. But also, uh, yeah, we are still at the first stage of the ownership of this um, uh, generation ownership of uh, good good point. Business. Yeah, thank you very much. Every 20, 25 years, there is a shift of generation. So given the, the, the so-called changes in Bulgaria in the, let's call it early 90s, yeah, now, now it's time to measure that succession and see if we see family firms that they entrust the leadership maybe to non-family professionals. Yes, you're right. Good comments. Thank you. Novo Blagodaria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Any comments from the students, maybe? Finally, I have one final question, if you allow. It's your final one, Virginia. Choose your best one. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of questions, actually, on this topic, but we can take that offline. Uh, what happens, you mentioned, this was very interesting to me, that if an owner has two kids, that he should not separate the ownership of the company equally uh, between the two kids. Uh, but rather give the company to one of the kids and then give assets to the other kids, okay? But what happens if none of the kids is interested in the business? I know in said... the case I have friends who have, the father is now old, he has two kids, none of them wants, none of them is interested. And okay. he at the same time, he doesn't want to to sell the company and divide it between them. So... What in, happens? Yes, in that case, if if nobody is interested, you know, obviously uh, there is the option to sell the business. That's called exit. But again, if it's a heritage business that has been in the family for five, six, seven generations, it's a sin to sell it. So in that case, they may they may skip generation they could um, put the shares in a trust and the trustees are guided how to run and manage the business for 50 years. And then after 50 years, it goes back openly into family hands. But because um, you asked a couple of questions about succession planning and obviously with good governance uh, they will take care of succession. I have here also the so-called 10 steps for succession planning. Okay, first of all, we need to train and enthuse 
you know, the next generation so that they are interested to join the family business. There is a lot of psychology and sometimes the kids do not want to join the family business because they have not enjoyed parental pastoral care when they were small because the parents concentrated all their efforts in running the family business. So the next generation reacts psychologically and they don't want to join the family business and do the same to their kids. Because the topic of family business has been established by psychologists, you know, for workaholic parents, okay? So number one, training, discussion on the options, on the rules, yeah? Next is to get experience outside the family business, yes? In a, in a better run family business. Then we need to get them into the family business and test them with small projects. Maybe if we have, say, the three business units, one in Sofia, another one in Sofia, and the third one in Blondiv, we could send the, the next generation to run the Blondiv the, the, the uh, unit so that they are, you know, allowed to build their confidence, their recognition, etc. And then we need to choose the best and announce the best as the emerging leader so that we can ensure when we are around, we let go and we extend support to the next chosen. Okay, to lead. We need to give this person voting shares, especially if we are talking about a small family business. Okay, help them to set up also a small advisory to support them in the transition. Okay, and then I repeat, it's all about equity and not equality. We could offer the voting shares to the person that we lead and non-voting shares to other active members of the family, uh, passive shares, passive shareholders, we call them, okay? To those people that they are not interested, we can give them assets, okay? But in your case, we'll transfer the shares in a trust and pass the business to the grandchildren and not to the second generation kids if they're not interested. Okay? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, so, good solution. <laughs> yes, let's hope there are some companies in Bulgaria. Yes? So, so, any other questions? No, no more questions? Yeah, I think there is a lot of food for thought for all of us. Uh, because as I said, this topic is not debated here in Bulgaria for a number of reasons, maybe because we are still not experienced with it. So it's on the one hand, a new topic for us. On the other hand, it's very, very, very important. Okay. So now you gave us indeed Thank you. Opportunities to think. Thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to continue the, the discussion with the uh, University, the leadership and uh, my fellow academics. And if any students are interested to do their dissertation on the topic, please let me know and I'm happy to join the co-supervision team. So that oh, we can get yes. some Bulgarian case studies as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Panikos. This is great indeed. Your expertise is so important for us. And we really thank you for the for the very interesting lecture. It was an honor having you with us. And I hope that it was really interesting for all our participants today. And we look forward to our cooperation to expanding our cooperation with you and with your university. Gladly. Thank you very much.
Ok, lega noștri, ciao! Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.